then you just be like, I'm not going to take it. Bigger pet peeves with me, I think, are more about preparation. You know, this is the thing. I understand sometimes we give you guys auditions at like midnight, and some of that stuff is out of our hands, especially with commercials, because they come at the last minute and people fake last minute decisions. I always do my best to give you guys at least 48 hours notice. And I would say just, for me, like not taking the time to look at your sides and prepare and read the script <coughs> available is a big one with me. I've had people come in and be like, I looked at it in the car for 20 minutes. I feel like then you come in not really relating to the character <coughs> and the script and not really like doing your homework because I want you guys to add a little bit of yourselves and you can't do that in 20 minutes, especially with the acting side. You know, commercial side, fine. I mean, you know, you guys can come in and read the stuff in 10 minutes, but I think that's a big pet peeve of mine. It's just like not being prepared. Not even knowing the details about the project. I've had people just be like, my manager gave it to me. I didn't really know anything. So I always tell you guys, if you are having one of those days where like you got it late, something messed up with your email, always call and ask for a reschedule. If they won't reschedule, then you do the best you can. But at least like don't sign in until you've taken 30 minutes to look over everything. You know what I mean? Tell your HR manager or the casting director you're going to be late. Say you're stuck in traffic. You know what I mean? It's better for you to take the time. Another thing is, my when I send out audition notices, and Todd, who's coming for me before, can tell you guys, I'm like very specific, right? Yeah. I leave oh, yeah. you like the longest message ever. That's a big pet peeve of mine. I give you guys all the information in that message and not reading it is a big thing with me because it tells you where to get your sides. It tells you, tells you if there are sides. It tells you where to email me if you want to reschedule. Like I, because I'm working on multiple projects, I like you guys to reschedule by emailing me directly instead of through the site because it gets complicated. But not reading that message is a big pet peeve of mine too. I had an actor come in and say, well the message said you wanted a headshot. And I said, no it didn't. And he was offended then when I wouldn't take it. Turn to do a big like, yeah, thing. So reading that message. Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> Please read the message all the way through very thoroughly. I think the third thing is, look, if you have a theatrical audition and you don't get size or you can't, you don't see them and there's no instructions, do your homework and really dig and find out if they're size because. If you have a theatrical audition, you probably have sides. And I've had people come in and say, well, there was no sides posted. I didn't know where to get them. Well, I almost want to say, well, you know, you've been acting for long enough to, well, that sounds bad. So let's not put that one. I just want to say, look, theatrical auditions always have sides. So if you can't find them, please, like, contact everybody on God's green earth until you can't get an answer. Okay. Um, what can help, or, or what, basically when you're looking to bring people in um, on any of like the casting sites, yeah. what sort of allows you to like click on their profile to want to bring somebody in? So you know, I, I have to go through a lot of submissions, um, no matter the size of my project, I would say. For me, what's going to load me in first is do you have kind of the look and the essence I'm looking for? Then, because just so you guys know, what happens is on those casting sites, we get 100 profiles per page. So there's like a little oh, square. Yeah, it's like a little square with like your headshot. And then it has little icons on the side or on the bottom that like go to, you know, piece of paper for the resume. Different stuff. That's what gets me there first. And look, every project needs a different look and needs a different essence. So if I don't pick you, it may be just because this is the project that you're right for. After that, then I will open up the resume and see what's there. And I think that what happens is, people ask me, well, how do you make a choice? It's not an exact, I would tell you guys there's no exact answer, and I wish I could give you one. But as casting directors, our bosses are the producers and directors, and they kind of have different requirements. So I would say to you just a, a general, if you want me to kind of 
general is that, you know, if it's a lead film, if it's a lead in a film, no matter the budget or the size, because I do do student projects as well as my regular stuff, I do need something that can carry my film. So I do look for you to have some lead credits in there. You know, um, classes are always good, the training, but for me, I think the credits are more important. You know, so TV is nice, but not a big one for me. I think now with webisodes, TV is good if you're, when I'm doing the webisode, because I know you've been on a series and you carry, kind of, you've been on a, you've had a good chunk on a TV show, so I know you can deal with a web series. Um, supporting roles, um, depending on the size of the film, that will vary. Sometimes I need somebody to have a good amount of credits supporting and leads. Sometimes with my student films, I feel like I can be a little bit more forgiving and give people more of a chance who don't have a lot of credits. And I think with the bigger projects, I'm talking about supporting, with supporting credits and all that, bigger projects, like with bigger size projects, indies, you know, something substantial. I would say to you with my student films or with supporting roles, like, and my more very independent stuff, I can be more, I feel like I, I have more room to be more forgiving and bring in new talent because I'm a little bit more open, open. But when you're dealing with people that are, you know, have $2 million projects, these producers are always kind of talking about credits. Once people have credits. But every, but just you guys know, every project is different. And commercials these days, those really are about what I hate. It's really about what I hate. So are you saying that $2 million productions and above, you don't have the final say-so? I do not. I mean, I, in reality, I don't have the final say-so in anything. But when I'm doing like my more independent projects and my more student, the student films and more where it's like a collaborative thing, I can give my recommendations and my suggestions. But at the end of the day, the final say is up to the producer and the director, and mostly the director. And so just so you guys know, if you don't book something and you make the callback, it just really comes down to a lot of times like stupid little things. The mil mil like the littlest things. And Manny's produced like something like, oh, she's too, I don't know, if she's too, not, not skinny enough, not hair's too short, not quite the look we're looking for. The family, she's not going to look right with the child. It's just little things. Raise your hand if there's an empty seat. Right here. Come on. Um, so, okay, so then, has there been an actor or actress that has auditioned for you? The production wanted nothing to do with them, they didn't pick them, but you brought them back for other projects? Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> sorry, Todd, I didn't use you as an example. <laughs> Todd's actually, but I think Todd, you booked, you booked something with me. However, before that, yeah, Todd had always done like a really good job for me. And honestly, you guys, and I call him in every time I have something that's right. So I have a, and you've come in for me more than once as well. I recognize, yeah, I think so. I recognize you. Maybe not.
their job, their yeah. livelihood Depends is dependent on, yeah. if they can find great people. Otherwise, they'll just hire another casting director. So you should always understand that casting directors are not on your side. It's just sometimes the situation seems nerve-wracking, but you always want to make a fan of the casting director. Yeah, like, I mean, a good example is I oftentimes, when I have assistance because I'm so busy, I do have to run my two sessions at one time. And I have days where it's overwhelming. And I always make my audition rooms really comfortable and make you guys feel good and give you guys room to play. The commercials, granted, have to go like a lot faster. But I think like no matter what kind of day a casting director is having, because we have bad days, don't let their mood bring you down. Because A, you make a good impression in the room and are friendly, like we're going to remember you. And B, you're just not always right for every project you come in for. It's just the, the reality. That's why we do set That's why we have a few sessions. I remember that. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Was that good enough for the. Oh, yeah, for the. Uh, for the that, yeah, that yeah, is, yeah. The, the dominatrix. Right. <laughs> you're not crazy. <laughs> Real quick. Um, last words from you. What advice, even though we're going to answer your questions. I, if you came in late, the card that you have, please write. If there's any question, don't try to make up a question. If you have it, but if there is a question that you wanted to ask, please write it on that card. So we're going to answer them. Um, if we don't get to it today, right. over the holidays. But is there anything like from your heart, if you have one thing that you would share, all of a sudden there was an earthquake and we all have to run out of here, what would you say? That's not going to happen. I, um, I would just tell you guys that we want you to succeed. We're not out to not have you do that. And I think what a lot of actors, what a lot of you don't understand is we, like you, are freelance, you know what I mean? We don't know unless, you know, Look, you know, even though people that have TV jobs, you don't know when that TV job is going to end. So, I think just remember that, like you guys, we also have to go out there and seek those jobs and all of that. And we, if we select you, you know, we want you to come in there and rock it. I would just say to you guys, just remember the casting director is on your side. And the other thing I can say is, if you're... I think the actors that come in and like love what they do and don't put so much pressure on themselves to get the job, acting becomes a much happier thing. It doesn't become like a pressure cooker situation. You know what I mean? And I think you're happier and you can feel it in that way. And I will tell you guys, look, if you love this, even if you have to leave people and whatever, just keep pursuing it because, you know, when I started doing this, I had to I had to do personal assistant work. I had to do what I had to do because I loved it so much. So I think just you have to keep going if this is what you love. And just remember, as casting directors, we want you guys to succeed. Literally forwarding a audition right now for one of my talents. <laughs> so okay, um, thank you, Carl. You're welcome. I I'm a newer manager. I've been managing for about two years. Um, the first year was rough because it is a very small pool, and this thing is, is really based off relationships. So the same way as an actor, you have to try to network and meet casting directors and make them friends of yours. As a manager, you have to do the exact same thing. Then you also have to meet agents, and you have to make them like you. But they don't want to like you, right? So it's like, so it is tough. And it's one of those catch-22s where when you're an actor, you know, you want a theatrical agent, but you don't have a great reel. But then you feel like in order to get a great reel, you need a theatrical agent. So it's like this catch-22. Or you want, you know, certain projects, but you're not union. But then you have to get certain projects to be union. And now you can just pay your way into the union. But if you do that, then you don't have the credits and the resume to compete against the people who have been SAG actors and actresses 
building their self for the last seven or eight years. So there's always this like crazy sort of what came first, the chicken or the egg type of thing, right? Um, so my first year was just doing a lot of um, just knocking on the door and you know pushing my way through. Even trying to get on the casting sites was tough, very, very tough. This, uh, this past year though, I broke through. We've had several nationals, from Farmers to um, Burger King to Sam's Club. One of my talents, she had a theatrical release with the Fanatic, so she had like her red carpet event. And you know, making pretty good money now, but that first year was really, really tough. And I honestly had to use all of the skills that I learned as an actor, every single one, in order to like grow the management company. Um, so I started off as an actor. I'm from LA. I grew up right by the Grove. If you guys know where the SAG building is, Park La Brea, that community, that's where I'm from. So I always tell people like, if I grew up in New York, I would probably sell, you know, stocks and bonds, but this is all I ever knew. Um, and I had a full scholarship to Alabama State for theater. I decided I didn't want to go out there and do musical theater <laughs> um, out in Alabama when I'm from LA and I wanted to do TV and film. So I wind up, you know, not taking my scholarship and staying out here. And so what did I do? I went to Craigslist for the answer, and I wind up, I wind up finding an acting class. And to this day, three of my really close buddies. Um, that's where we all met. And Ashley Bryan, Christopher Roosevelt, who's a director now, yeah, um, Jackie Penn, T and Fam. And so we were all young and hungry and wanted to get on TV. So what did we do? We Googled agencies and we walked into the agencies. Didn't have any headshots, didn't have any type of material. We didn't, we didn't know that we needed it. Um, we walked into CAA. We walked into William Morris. We walked into APA, UTA, uh, Paradigm. All of them kicked us out, uh, literally. Uh, but we were we were hungry, and we didn't have enough sense to even ask them like, "Well, how do we submit to you?" So we just kept going. And after a while, Chris had stopped, TN stopped, but me and Ashley, we were determined to get on TV. And so then we started you know, Googling more, so then we started to go to like the Daniel Halls, the Mavericks, uh, Abrams, Coast to Coast, CESD, all the same thing. With those, they at least told us um, there's a drop-off box, so you can put your stuff there. <laughs> Once again, we didn't know what to drop off, so I literally, we would take papers and put our name, our email, and say that, you know, please, you know, reach out to us. We, we believe that we could be on TV and we would drop it in. <laughs> Retarded. <laughs> <laughs> but determined, determined to make it. Um, one day I, and it was always easier with Ashley to like walk into these places, but one day Ashley had to work, and so the first agency that I went to was Lemon Lime, and I met Robin, who sort of changed like the course of my career, because Robin was the first agent that took time, and she was like, Where's your headshot? And I was like, what's that? Um, and she was like, you know what? You go figure out what a headshot is and then bring it back and then we'll talk. So what did I do? Went to Craigslist and I researched headshots. I wind up finding this guy that uh, charged me $1,000 to oh shoot God. black and white uh, modeling portfolio <laughs> for me. And so I got those shots. So I'm thinking like, yeah, I got my headshots. So I go back. And Robin, she's, oh. she's like, you know what? There's something about you I like. So she brought me to like her office, and she took a stack of headshots and she you know, put them all across the desk. And then she said, you know, put your shots there. So here I had like all her talent and their beautiful colored headshots, and I have my black you know and black and white shots. And she was like, all right, which ones are ugly? And I had to agree. Mine were terrible compared to these. But that was the first time that I had this aha revelation of, oh wow, I know how I can get on TV. Because I realized, here's an agent 
And to me, I always felt agents just put you on TV. I didn't even really know that you had to like audition and be casting directors. I thought you just had to get an agent. So this agent wasn't telling me that I don't like your charisma, I don't like your smile, I don't like your look, I don't like the way that you talk. She's literally telling me that you don't have what my other clients have, and all it was was headshots. And to this day, if anybody asks me, headshots are the most powerful thing that you can have that can change the course of your career. So once I got that knowledge, then I went back, I, um, I found out about IMDb Pro, so I went on every single agent. Um, I was just like, for like two weeks, just going on every single actor's profile. Um, I researched every single headshot photographer in LA, and it just started to make sense, like which ones like actually seemed amazing. And there was a couple of companies, I think Vane was the first person I shot with, and at that time, I had also started to like meet other actors in class, and so somebody told me about Daniel Hoff, and I should have went probably with Robin, who had shared all this information, but I didn't. I auditioned for Daniel Hoff's open call at that time. Um, I failed four times. It was my fifth time that I went that he actually signed me, and then within three months, I wind up booking my first national, but I didn't get it from me. So as soon as I figured out that your headshot could actually get you like into a agent's office, then I told Ashley, and then Ashley did the same thing. And then Chris followed suit, and then TN followed suit. And so even though we were very competitive, we always wanted one of us to like make it. So every single time, besides TN, because he's Asian, so he wouldn't forward his emails or his auditions, but Chris and Ashley, they have somewhat my same look. And as soon as we would get an audition, we would forward it to each other. So we would go and crash each other's auditions. So my first two auditions, nationals that I booked, were Ashley's auditions. Ashley's first national that he booked was my audition. And Chris's first national that got him on TV was my audition. And so we became professional crashers. And we did that. Um, okay, I'm going to fast forward. So now we'll skip like six years. Okay, so this is the way that you do stuff is usually how you do everything. So there was a situation like this, it was a seminar, and one of my dream agencies was there, which was Innovative. So I did a performance, Innovative took me on theatrically, which was always my goal to be a series regular. So once I got with Innovative, all of a sudden I started going after like all series regular roles, like the Ballers, Originals, um, the Original. Originals. Originals. Yeah. Originals. Spin off of Vampire Diaries. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, so I was finally competing like where I wanted to be, right? And Ashley went, so at this time I had just turned 28, I started to lose my hair. So I had long curly hair. So it was the first time that branding um, started to like happen. And I didn't know how to deal with that because everyone seen me as this like youthful, I used to be super fit. And it's like now I had to go out after like cop roles and young dad, but I was still feeling like a young like 22 year old. So I didn't know how to really deal with that transition. But Ashley got an audition for Grey's Anatomy. And he was like, yo man, literally the character, he's light skinned, he has um, prayer tattoos. Like that's what it said in the description. I have prayer hands on my shoulder. Um, he was dealing with, he was from the army, so he needed a shave head, which I had. So it was like, just everything was just perfect for me. And Ashley was even a little darker than me, and in the description it said light skin. So Ashley was like, dude, you have to like get in. Innovative wouldn't get me in, my manager wouldn't get me in, so Ashley was like, well, you know what we're gonna do. <laughs> so I went to meet him. So I met him at Prospect Studios, and I proceeded to get in the trunk of his car. <gasps> now I found out that I'm like claustrophobic. So I was up to, to the gate, and I'm like panicking. And I didn't know, like there was like levers in the trunk. So I almost pulled it, and the lady would not let Ashley onto the lot. So Ashley gets out, and he's limping, and he's like, hey, he's like, look, I just got in an accident. I'm late to my audition, please, please. Like, so he's begging, so she finally lets him go through. 
Um, so we park way off into like the parking area so they can't see. Pops the trunk, I'm drenched in sweat. So I wind up wearing his like workout shirt to go audition. And basically I get in there, everybody before me is one scene. So we would always ask actors, how many scenes are they having you do? So everybody did one scene, Ashley did one scene. So I go in there and the agent was like, um, are you prepared? And I was like, yes, absolutely. So, and I knew there was, you know, something was up, but you can't let them know that you're crashing, right? So I was acting like I was supposed to be there. I killed the scene. And then she goes, that was interesting. Um, you're not prepared with any of the other material, are you? And I was like, yes, actually, scene two and three. So she had me do two and three. And then after she just, she took like two minutes. It was weird. It was just like awkward si silence. She was like, I don't know what to do with you. She was like, are you available to do the producer session later? So I said, yes, of course. And she goes, okay, um, we'll reach out. So we're closing right now. Yeah. As I was walking to the car, I get a call from my manager. And my manager's cursing at me. And she's like, what did you do? And I was like, yo, I just did an amazing job. She was like, yes, you did, but Innovative just dropped you. And so the same thing that got me on TV was the same thing that at the height of my career crushed me. After that, three months later, I had to go get a regular job. My residual stopped. I had got into drugs. And so, because I was really depressed after that. And I never was able to rebound from that moment. And, um, but from there, that's what pushed me into working with casting directors, managers, agents. And I've seen that, okay, so I understand something that these people that went to school don't. And that's because I've been on the pavement actually as an actor figuring out how to make this thing happen. And that's pretty much sort of how I moved over into the prof not say professional side, but stepped in, out of acting and helping other actors. So for you as a manager, like when you're when people are presenting packages to be rep, what's like what are some of your pet peeves? So like maybe three don'ts. I would say to you guys your headshot should absolutely look like you. Like both of us totally yeah. agree. And and the the shortest way to answer that is just you have to know you're going to spend money. Like this it, it's a business. So people are like, oh man, I don't want to spend money to, to get headshots, to get an agent, then the agent's gonna have me shoot new headshots. It doesn't matter. Like you have chosen to be an actor or actress. You know how many people want to actually be on TV? Like you're risking your your youth, some of you are older, but you're risking your lives like to do this thing. Like it's probably the hardest profession outside of being an astronaut and flying to the moon. Because there's no certain path, like at least if you're a doctor, like you can go get your degree and you'll always be able to go be a manager somewhere and make a decent living. But if you fail as an actor, years of your life have passed. So some of you, like you won't have relationships, like it, it's just crazy. So like I said, I, I truly believe that you have to save your money, sacrifice, stop drinking Starbucks and know that you're gonna spend at least 1500 to start off. Like, have the top headshots. That's the first thing that anybody's going to see. That literally, even me, when I have relationships with these agents, I've been able to get people in, but it's not just like, hey, this person looks great, this person does, where's their headshot and resume? But the first thing before they look at the resume is the headshot. So you have to invest in your headshots. Like, that's your number one tool. And then, Know what you're going to say in the meeting. That becomes your audition. So know your story. Look at Disney. All the Disney characters, they start with this journey. So when you're sitting in front of an agent, you should be able, when they say, so tell me something about yourself. Be able to like literally take them on a roller coaster to see how you um, had a desire to want to do this. But it shouldn't be an interview. You should already be pre prepared practice, speak in front of your mirror, take yourself, like you should be able to talk for 10 minutes about yourself to show your charisma. Because it's a feeling that they're looking to get. Because they literally, and most agents will only see you that first meeting. Then it's not like they're, they're meeting you all the time. 
So they want to trust that if they put their name on you and send you out, that you're going to be charismatic and be able to get the job done because it all comes down to who's going to make money. That's why they're agents, yeah. to make money. That's it. Yeah, and, you, and I think just like, you know, no, you kind of have to know your brand. And we have to start, so yep. you have to know your brand and just know like where you are. Like, be honest with yourself about what you can play right now in life and with your skill set. Don't, don't, if you can, if you're going to say you do something, you better be like an expert at it when you tell your agent that. Because there's nothing like, I hate it when people put Spanish and then the agent's like, oh, can't tell you, they don't really speak Spanish. Please don't, like, be honest about that. Okay, and we'll, I think that wraps up the talk. Thank you so